What's going on, Facebook family? This is Wesley Spencer with the Saginaw African Cultural Festival. Um, today is the virtual celebration, and um, I hope y'all have fun with us uh, yesterday for On the Grounds. So it was great getting the good food, meeting with people, getting the entertainment, and today we have something very special. All right, so as you know, the theme of this year, you know, this festival has been around for a very long time. This is 53 years now, is Ujamaa. Ujama, which is Cooperative Economics. So I have a powerful guest speaker here for you today. His name is Dr. OBT Shaka. Um, he's an educator, um, a speaker, and, um, and a beautiful mind that came right out of the times of the liberation movement. And I'm gonna introduce him to y'all today so he can give a powerful lecture and really drop the wisdom of our culture, spirituality, and really teach us ways that we can uplift our community through the principle of Ujama. Dr. Obutishaka. How you doing, brother? Doing good. When you're ready, you can turn on your camera. Okay. All right, well, it's your show. Thank you so much for uh, spending this time, sharing your time with us today. And if you need anything from me, I will be right here to support. Yeah, just put the um, address for the show up so people see it. Okay, I wanna uh, thank you and uh, all the viewers uh, from the African Cultural Festival in Saginaw, Michigan. And I understand this is uh, historically an important festival. Uh, you've had John Henry Clark and many other uh, outstanding uh, speakers attend this over the years. And uh, Brother Lao Tzu, uh, who was a supporter of the Dr. Ober Tshaka show that you'll see uh, the link uh, pushed on this program. I encourage people to watch it on the 21st of uh, August at 10 a.m. Pacific time, but it will be up there uh, permanently once the show is on. We'll have Dr. Theophel Obinga, uh, who is the foremost expert on ancient uh, dynastic Egypt in the world. And uh, he will be our guest. And uh, our last show, which is up on the Dr. Ober Tshaka show now, um, is dealing with uh, healing from the trauma that's been caused by the forces that have hit Black communities and made a lot of Black youth unemployable and stuck them in the prison industrial complex um, and broken up Black communities and created uh, real problems for our people. And so we had people on uh, yesterday, uh, on the 14th of August, uh, who had expertise in um, trauma and also expertise in uh, black masculinity. And so uh, check that out, the Dr. Ober Tshaka show. So it's an honor to uh, have a chance to uh, discuss with you Ujama, uh, or literally it means familyhood. It's been embraced as a part of Kwanzaa and um, it speaks to cooperative economics or sharing uh, cooperatively. I wanna give you a little background uh, on me. My name is Oba Tshaka, Dr. Oba Tshaka. I was professor at San Francisco State for 40 years, taught over 16,000 students. Uh, I'm a warrior scholar. I have 61 years of organizing in the black liberation, black power, black freedom and Afrocentric movements. And I'm still active uh, in organizing. Um, I am also a scholar and I've written five books. Uh, the Political Legacy of Malcolm X, which was rated number one in comparison to all books in the New York Times book review section by Michael Eric Dyson. Uh, number one against all books on Malcolm X. And that book came out in 1964. I met Malcolm uh, in 1963 as I was leading 
the largest of the northern freedom movements, which I'm going to discuss today in the context of economic development. Um, my second and third books are The Art of Leadership, Volume 1 and Volume 2. They are close to 900 pages. These are the only books in the modern world that deal with our leadership systems, practices, philosophies. It's not a book on great Black leaders. It took me 10 years to write. And um, it's, you know, I, I've, I've had a wide range of organizing experience. And this book is used by community organizations. It's used in Black studies departments. It's used in Black seminary programs. Uh, it's used by African people all over the world. Um, my third book, or my fourth book, was Return to the African Mother Principle of Male and Female Equality. And this book is considered a classic by leading scholars in the field. And um, it's a book that deals with many things, but most importantly, it's the only book in the world that's accurately defined the African and African-American family model, which I define as not matriarchy where women rule, not patriarchy where men rule, not matrilineal where you're inheritance, last name usually comes through the line of the mother, or patrilineal where your inheritance, last name usually comes through the line of the father. But based on groundbreaking research, and I'm the only scholar in the world that's uncovered this, I've uncovered the model for our families that are as good for us today as they were um, 144,000 years ago when African people came into being as the first human beings on the planet. And um, this system I call not matrilineal, not patrilineal, but, but twinlineal, T-W-I-N-L-I-N-E-A-L, -L, which describes how our family systems work. And uh, it means essentially that uh, you're not descended from the mother alone or the father alone, but mother and father, not grandmother alone or grandfather alone, grandmother and grandfather. And not God who's he or God who's she, but God probably isn't a person. But if you're gonna conceive of God in sexual terms, then he, she. But it means also that in African family systems, uh, decision-making was shared. Um, and as a consequence, as Dr. Sheikh Ana Diop who Dr. Rabinga and I will be talking about, um, one of the greatest scholars on ancient Africa and ancient Egypt and the world, he's passed on. He noted that in ancient Africa and traditional Africa, before the coming of Christianity, Islam, colonialism or slavery, there was no systematic mistreatment of African women. And this is because African women had power. And they were really the major source of the food supply of Africa and still are. Uh, so uh, this is the model that I found when we look at black families that are really working well in the US or around the world today, they have this balance, this interchange. And my family, it operates on this. The uh, fifth book I wrote is uh, The Integration Trap Generation Gap Caused by a Choice Between Two Cultures. And this book identifies why our youth are in such bad shape now, why Black communities have been fragmented, what the forces were that hit Black communities since 68, and how it put us in a position of choosing between our rich African-American culture and European or European-American culture. We're seeing some behavior in the post-68 period in our communities we've never seen before, and it comes through the fracturing of Black families and extended family communities, the rise of prison industrial complex, and a host of other things, the placing of drugs in our community by the intelligence agencies as they've admitted. So that's kind of my background. My, the battles I've engaged in have been the basis for me waking up. And um, it's been the basis for my scholarship and for me beginning to hit the right books. Now, um, the context for this discussion is Ujamaa, uh, Cooperative Economics. 
but it's gonna be placed in a broader context because there's a broader context that we have to look at when it comes to the economic condition of our people that ties into cooperative economics. And so I'll be speaking from experience as well as study. And um, these are things that I've done and they are things that are useful, as useful today as they were yesterday. Uh, so I wanna start because I wanna put the issue of cooperative economics in the context of economics in general and for black people in the context of jobs. Because if you don't have a job, you're not gonna have the capital to set up a business. Um, and if you have a job, if you don't have a job, you're not gonna have the basis to start a family, let alone put a roof over your head. And a lot of our people are either lacking jobs now or uh, they are underpaid jobs. But for the most part, our youth are heavily unemployed. So in discussing this issue of Ujamaa, I'm gonna connect it to the broader issue of economics and jobs uh, as they uh, impact our people. And I'll be talking about the context of the past to learn from it so that we can look at how can we use some of these things that have worked before today. Some of the stuff I'm gonna tell you, you know nothing about because generally our successes are generally not known and our failures are exaggerated. So um, I was an organizer and still am. And in the sixties, I led the largest of the Northern Black freedom movements. By Black freedom movement, these are movements that have been called civil rights, but our people never called them that. The movement in San Francisco, which I led, and the movements in the South, the King or the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee or CORE all uh, led, these movements were called Black freedom movements. Blacks had no concept of these being civil rights movements. The movement that I led in San Francisco that has relevance to this discussion today was the largest of the Northern freedom movements. At its peak, we had 10,000 people in the streets for a year, uh, but it was a six year movement. This was not a movement that occurred overnight from 1960 to 1966. Now, as we look at economic development, both the job issue and cooperative or Ujamaa economic development, uh, we need to, in, in terms of learning from the past, we need to understand that we've had great victories as a people in this country. And one of the biggest victories when it comes to the freedom movement was the Southern Black freedom movement. And this is often not given enough credit they were successful in defeating the white political system of segregation um, in the 60s, starting with the Montgomery bus boycott in 1955. Um, and so they were successful in ending formal legal segregation and um, ending the full denial of the right to vote of Blacks, especially in the South. We see now campaigns uh, carried out by uh, Republican governors to dismantle um, your right to vote or to decrease your voting power through all kinds of methods. And these are things that we have to fight. The Northern Freedom Movement, uh, unlike the Southern one, and we're talking about what people normally call the civil rights movement that goes from 55 to 65, especially. Uh, with one exception, the Northern Freedom Movement failed to defeat the Northern white power structure, um, the way in which, and of course it would be in a different way, the way in which the South achieved its victory against the Southern white political power structure. Uh, the Northern uh, Freedom Movement failed uh, for two reasons, except for one movement. <laughs> and you guess what that movement was. 
it, it failed for two reasons. One, it failed to clearly identify the core issue or issues facing black people in the North that had to be addressed if black people were gonna improve their lives. It failed to identify that. There was sporadic, that is piecemeal identification. There was some movements in the North that on a piecemeal basis uh, addressed this, but not systematically. And generally there was no agreement except in one area of the country on even what that issue was. So this was the first failure of the Northern movement. And I should point out, it was pretty obvious in the South that segregation and the denial of the right to vote was the issue. And it was an issue of dignity. It was an issue of freedom. And we had been denied this since 1876 with the Hayes-Tilden Compromise, where Blacks were denied the right to vote and uh, legal segregation was put into effect. So um, Southern Blacks were very clear on what they wanted. They wanted the vote and they wanted the end of legal apartheid, legal segregation. Had, had Northern movements gone to their people, they would have found out what the people wanted. But here's, here's the second reason for the failure except in one place of the Northern movement. And it was that it failed to develop a mass strategy and a mass methodology, which are basically pretty much the same, that could assure victory around what the people identified as the core issues. And so these two failures had to do with one, uh, not um, identifying what the key issue was that, that Black people wanted, that Black people needed for their condition to improve. And secondly, not identifying the method that would work. And of course, you're not gonna have a method unless you have the issue or issues. Um, there was only one movement um, in the country that uh, effectively identified uh, this core issue. Um, and that one, is, uh, that one movement was the San Francisco freedom movement that I was privileged to lead. And I'm not saying it because I led it, because as you get into in a minute, I've never lost any battles. And wherever a successful campaigns are waged by our people or anybody else, I'm the first to acknowledge it. So it just so happened that this happens to be the movement, but it was not by accident. And you haven't heard about this movement. Uh, so um, this movement uh, developed not only the identification of the issue and the method, but it developed a systematic organizing strategy that led to the defeat of the entire economic power structure of San Francisco. And that was done nowhere in the country. And I don't criticize the South for not dealing with the issue of jobs and business development because that wasn't the first issue on their plate. They had to deal with segregation and the vote first. But it was, I'll get into it in a minute, it definitely was the issue in the North. Um, so my topic today, Ujama or cooperative economics, I'm addressing my movement background because the San Francisco freedom movement, which I led, was the only freedom movement in the North that defeated an entire economic power structure for jobs. We're talking thousands and thousands and thousands of jobs. Um, and it was the only movement that built cooperative housing. And I led that uh, for our people. You haven't heard about this movement, you know what I mean? And by the way, the people who made up this movement had an unwritten rule, our members did, that none of us would take any of those jobs. We were an unbought movement. We had no money. We were always wondering how we'd get the sense to pay the rent 
because we had headquarters that we organized out of and we had a core of 100 people and it's 100 people that gave birth to a big bad movement but we were sellout proof and that was not unusual across the country you had a lot of movements that were sellout proof nobody owned us we served the best interests of the black community so um this was the real success of this movement i really want to stress this while i was the major leader in a number of ways in this movement our success was based on the fact that we had a team a team of uh talented people but the most uh important quality we had as a team is we had our egos in check and that was the key to our success we made decisions based on what was the best decision not based on somebody having to be the person that had to run something whoever was the best that was the one that we put in charge of a particular uh campaign so we had a number of people that played very important roles uh in the movement so um when i became chair of core uh, in San Francisco in 1963, I'd been, at, at that point, I was still brainwashed. I underwent an awakening in 1963. Um, but I had just cashiered out of the Marine Corps. I'd been in the Marine Reserves for six years. And uh, I thought it was a great thing until I woke up in the movement and later found out, uh, -uh. <laughs> but having an honorable discharge meant no Vietnam. I was going to go anywhere. So in 1963, I become chair in January of 63. I'd been elected chair in 62, the end of 62. I was a student uh, at San, I was in law school. I was in uh, my first year of law school. I'd graduated from San Francisco State University where I ended up teaching for 40 years later. And so when I became chair of core, I had one thing because generally everything went on consensus. That was my policy we made decisions on consensus, not majority vote. And so not one person was making decisions, but on this, this was my call. And my call was, I pulled, pulled the members together and said, everybody's going out in the black community and you're gonna ask one question. You're gonna go to the street, barbershops, beauty parlors, pool halls, churches, alcoholics, um, members of social clubs, men and women social clubs, every group you can get to, but mainly the people on the streets and ask them one question. It's only one question. What do you want? One question. Because my idea and the, and the idea of our members was we serve the best interests of the Black community. And so I've often asked a number of people recently, so what do you think people said? You know? And I'd ask some of you right now, and given the fact that you've had a Black Lives Matter movement, you might say the police. Of course, the Panthers come along and we're the mother movement. We precede the Panthers. We precede the San Francisco state strike. We give birth to the free speech movement at UC Berkeley. We are the major movement at that time. Um, and so Huey, who was about Huey Newton, three or four years younger than me, he should have watched what we were doing because we had a chapter in Oakland, we had one in Berkeley, but the main chapter was in San Francisco. So what do you think people said? Too bad we don't have a chat up here, but I've had people say housing, education, they give all kinds of answers. And a few said what the people said. Jobs, 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 and jobs. You understand? had the other northern organizations and core was the primary northern freedom movement because student nonviolent coordinating committee um, and the southern christian leadership conference which king led uh, they were southern uh, organizations so they didn't have an organizational base in the north king had uh, uh student nonviolent coordinating committee had a fundraising arm in the north but not anything else and so um why would the people say jobs? Well, pretty clear. Because Blacks, including a lot of people related to me, came north during World War II to work in wartime factories. 
And when the war was over, those factories closed, those jobs were gone. And most blacks were unemployed. There were no jobs for blacks in any major industry, banking, um, department stores, um, restaurants, uh, the uh, supermarkets, uh, every place where you went and spent your money, you didn't have a job. Blacks were unemployed, you hear me? And so we were clear uh, that was the issue. Prior to me becoming chair, 50% uh, of core was white. By the time I became chair, 90% was black because blacks saw that as their issue. Uh, so um, if you ask the average black person today what the issue is, they're gonna say the same thing. They're gonna say jobs. And of course, more business development. We've lost 420,000 businesses through COVID. So we obviously have to strengthen businesses. We didn't get those small business loans in the first round, they went to big business. And we didn't get our proportion at any point. Some blacks did who really knew how to work the system, but a lot didn't. And so we've got to rebuild those jobs. But blacks have the highest unemployment rate now, uh, even as the economy is recovering. So jobs are a crucial issue uh, today. And I guarantee you, if you go into your community and ask people, what do they want? They'll say jobs, but they'll add something that they didn't say in the 60s. They'll say good paying jobs. They don't want um, the McDonald's Burger King jobs. So I'm, I don't have time for this today. There's a good way to make them good paying jobs. That's another topic. So, um, that was the issue. That was the issue that we had to address. Um, and because we had identified the issue, then uh, it was key that we develop a winning strategy. Now, we all have gifts, and most of us have more than one. And in my case, uh, I have a number, as everybody else does. I'm a scholar, I'm an organizer different things, public speaker, um, a writer, you know, teacher. But of all of my gifts, the one that I treasure most, the one that I enjoy exercising most is strategy. I'm a strategist, and that's a gift. And any movement that doesn't have a strategist is in trouble. And a lot of our movements at the head, sometimes the heads were not strategists. Sometimes it might have been a local chapter that had the strategies. And unless the people at the top were listening to them, they're gonna be in trouble because strategy next to God and love is the ultimate art. And by the way, it's an aesthetic art. Aesthetic means beauty. When strategy is executed correctly, only God and only love and of course, I would add Mother Nature and the cosmos are more beautiful. But, um, and in fact, when a, a master strategist or strategy is implemented, you won't even be able to see it because the ultimate art of strategy is to win a war without a fight. And I've won many wars without a fight. Been in the movement 61 years. I've fought many battles, big ones, and I've never lost one. Because as a strategist, you know never to enter the battlefield until you figured out how to whip your opponent. I'm a martial artist. I'm into Choli Foot Gung Fu. It's uh, the most popular of the um, martial arts in China. And 85% of the people in Hong Kong, because Hong Kong is the uh, school or the, the capital of martial arts in China, 80% 80, 80 of them are into Choli foot. It's a, a martial arts where you fight many opponents at the same time. Uh, but the whole point about martial arts is a good martial artist will avoid a fight. And in war, when you see bloody war, that means poor strategy. That means the people who have laid out the war like this one in Afghanistan that 
has just been officially lost. It's been lost for years. Um, it was an unjust war and it was also stupid. Everybody knows to leave Afghanistan alone. Nobody wins in Afghanistan. Just as most people knew, that is strategists knew, to leave Vietnam alone. Nobody ultimately wins in Vietnam if you study history. So uh, in my case, I was the principal strategist in the San Francisco Freedom Movement. If someone else had that talent, they would have been. There's no ego here, it just so happens. And I really didn't know I was a strategist until I got involved in the movement because I'd never, never led any movements before. So strategy is the ultimate art. Uh, it's second and third only to God and love. And if you see people in the world who are doing well, nations that are doing well, they're pursuing effective strategies. If you look at China, whatever you think about China, they've taken over 400 million people out of poverty. This country is driving more and more people into poverty. There's a strategy in this country for making the rich richer, but there's no strategy for uh, really seeing that there's prosperity for the people. So you're living in a country that operates on poor strategy for the people. It's very good for the people on top. So in the Northern movement, we were faced with a different situation than the Southern movement. I really wanna say this, that it had been no more Northern movement without the Southern movement. The Southern movement drove everything. They were the ones that started this. Montgomery bus boycott, great victory. 97% of black people stood up in the Confederacy. And it took a whole lot more courage for them to do what we did in the various movements we led in the North. Uh, so their, their achievement was singular. And I take my hat off of them to every day, to the men, women, children who stood up in this movement and were successful. So they faced a brutal situation. Um, but they came up with successful methods that worked. And those methods had to do with how they used the media. And it had to do with how they were able to provoke certain opponents into actions that were just savage. And it then brought the sympathy for Blacks, not only in this country, but globally. And that put pressure on the presidency and everyone else to have to take action. And they came up with the boycott and the Montgomery bus boycott and the march in Birmingham. They got you um, the uh, end of legal segregation. And in Selma, which I was a uh, march marshal, I got arrested in Selma, um, they got you voting rights. And so they had their methods, but the North was different. And so to have a successful movement that produced jobs and later could empower us more economically and also enable us to move in some areas of cooperative economic development, and in this particular case in the San Francisco Freedom Movement, housing, cooperative housing, uh, we had to deal with a different kind of enemy. And that enemy was a powerful economic power structure. And that powerful economic power structure runs the country. And still, while it's in decline, China's rising, um, it still manipulates a good part of the world. So for us to come up with successful strategies, uh, we would have to go up against naked economic power that ran everything, that ran the politicians, that ran the media, you know, um, that ran the educational system, that ran the police, and the police would definitely suck on us as they were in other places. So um, we would have to come up with a strategy that would enable us to implement the issue, the demand coming from our people, which was jobs. And then later, uh, in some cases, housing, but jobs was the key issue. Um, so we would have to rely on strategic power, the power we could draw from our community. We had less than 100,000 Black people in San Francisco. 
It was not the largest of black communities and it was a very complex environment. We had the largest Chinese American community, the only Japanese American community, a huge Latino community, heavily Mexican American and a Native American community, which we did not organize. We were not in contact with that community during uh, this movement. And then we had other forces out there, students and stuff, white and black, but largely white that could serve as potential allies. So the point is um, we had to look at our situation and look at what kind of strategic power did we have that would compel corporations to do our bidding, to do our will. And see, unlike the South, it wasn't gonna be based on the media. I mean, big business is not gonna go down on the jobs issue, which they don't wanna hire you and they don't wanna hire you right now. You know what I mean? They're not gonna go down on it uh, with a bull Connor strategy that King had in Birmingham where he was the public safety commissioner. He sucked the dogs on people that got sympathy. That wasn't gonna work, you know what I mean? And the march wasn't gonna work either, which was King's method. In fact, in all the movements I led, only one person was technically arrested, one. And that person, Gerald Turley, whose name I remember, had violated orders and got arrested in a campaign for jobs against the banks. Uh, so I wasn't into putting people in jail because it wasn't gonna get any results. In the South, it, it, it helped in some cases, but in the North, I was arrested 17 times but it was in supporting movements led by other people. Not me, I'm a strategist. I don't wanna put my people in jail because then they're being wrapped up in court and we need them in the streets. And that's just not gonna hurt the economic power structure. Now, in looking at this movement, we need to understand its relevance for today. Today, we have large numbers of black people and especially black youth who are frozen out of jobs, especially good paying jobs. Black gang structures have become families for Blacks because it used to be you get into a gang and then, you know, for various reasons, and then, you know, once you got a job, you're out of the gang. But now ain't no job, so gang for life. And that's not a very long life. So our people are caught in a vice, and especially our youth because especially the good paying jobs are not there for most of them. Now for a sector of blacks who go to college or who have specialized skills, yes, all blacks aren't in this position, but a large number of our people are. So the prison industrial complex becomes an employer of black youth, heavily black male youth who are in their free labor. It's basically slavery and it's affecting the culture. It's affecting the families because if you've got men in prison, you don't have them in the household. Homelessness is largely affected by the absence of jobs or some people who are homeless have jobs, but the jobs don't pay enough for them to um, you know, be able to pay rent. Out here in the Bay Area, that's the case. On the East Coast and many parts of the country. In fact, this country looks like a third world country now. People live in tents all over the country. So this issue of jobs isn't just a 60s issue. It is especially an issue now. And I might say Black Lives Matter that has done a very good job without them and their movement, Trump, along with COVID and his mishandling of it, Trump would still be in office. And so that mobilization around the police has been very important. And the hip hop generation has stood up and said that they're fighting back. And it's sisters who've led this. You've got to take your hat off to them. But I'll say this to Black Lives Matter. The police issue is still a mobilizing issue for you. It's a sporadic issue, meaning it gets turned on and off based on how angry Black people are. Ferguson, Black people got real angry. It kicked the movement off. George Floyd got so massively angry, combined with people being frustrated at being locked up in their homes and everything else on COVID, and uh, those who opposed Trump among the whites, especially white youth, were angry also, and Latinos and Asians and others that it burst out at the seams and you had a global movement. 50 states and 50 countries around the world. And that got Trump out of office. But I'll say this about Black Lives Matter. 
the police is not an ultimate winning issue because they are put in the black community, brown, red, and yellow, but especially red, to put people under control. And whatever minor changes you get with the police is not gonna be sufficient. And so continue to use this as your strategy for mobilizing, but then get down and organize. And one of the things you gotta organize is around jobs and the other one is business. And that's cooperative economics. And that's where you can produce some results. So this is important for today. So what I'm suggesting that what you can learn from this San Francisco freedom movement is applicable to today, uh, to jobs, as well as economic development, including cooperative housing, which I'll get into later. So what's extremely important about the strategies that we employed to get jobs for Blacks in 1963, 64, was that our strategy was one design, it was a mass strategy, and this was, my key point, it's got to affect the largest number of people. So it had to produce thousands of jobs. That's number one. It was a weak link strategy. We don't, we don't allow our enemy to gang up on us. We gang up on them, but piecemeal. So that's strategy. So that was key. So even though overall their power was greater than ours, when we break it down, you know, Ours could be greater than theirs. So it was an issue of how you attack your enemy at weak links. And I, I'm, I don't engage in a battle unless I can win. You're defeated already. If, if, if I'm leading something, you're already finished because I'm not fighting you unless I figured out how to whip you. You're already, you're already whipped. So the mass job strategy uh, required that we attack industries, not single employers. We took on whole industries. That was key. But we didn't take on all industries at once. We only took on one at a time. Um, and then we would use a weak link within the industry to attack that weak link to bring the industry down. Of course, it's after we gave them a chance to hire, because CORE had this thing about you had to negotiate before you took action. So. I knew they weren't going to do anything. So, you know, we gave them a chance, but we knew they weren't going to do anything. Um, so when they fell, when a weak link fell, the industry would fall. So this was my mass-based strategy that in, uh, exploited the weaknesses of powerful economic sectors. Um, and if we had a strategy that would normally work, but it proved when we put it into effect that it didn't, then we have to improvise something else. I'm not going into all the details of what we did, but I'll simply say we came up with some methods to bring out, bring down, say, supermarkets that provided the best jobs, retirement, um, uh, health care, and high pay, union jobs. And I used an unorthodox strategy that I don't have to go on time to go into that. But the key point is, we had a strategy to produce results for the largest number of people. Um, so here's the key point about that. We defeated the downtown department stores, all of them, um, by forming a coalition with the ministers, we used the boycott. It took us about three months the Christmas boycott after Kennedy's assassination, we brought them all down. It produced a whole lot of jobs for black people. We took on the supermarkets and they were like Bay Area wide. It was a whole lot of jobs, good paying union jobs. We beat them. Uh, we took on the hotel and restaurant industry where blacks, blacks had been excluded since 1876 from all those jobs and we beat them. We took on the automobile industry, we beat them. And then the biggest campaign in the movement, which I led against the biggest bank in the world, the Bank of America, that had been the Bank of Italy before, we took on them, took them on in 11 cities. And it took us six months, but I had a strategy laid out. And that strategy, the Bank of America to this, this day does not know how that worked. And we whipped them. And after we whipped the Bank of America, I'm in my office. I get a call from Wells Fargo, which is still one of the biggest banks in the world. The president of Wells Fargo is calling little old me. What they calling about? 
They said, if you could beat the biggest bank in the world, you could whip us, we're hiring. <laughs> so literally thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of jobs were produced for black people. And of course, people of color also benefited, but our primary emphasis was on black folks. So the point is, um, that provided the basis for businesses to thrive because blacks had money. It provided the basis for families to you know, thrive because blacks had the money to buy a house, a car, put their kids through school. At that time, education and college wasn't expensive. California paid for it. New York was the same at that time. But the key point is um, it produced prosperity in our communities. But here's, here's the thing. I learned a lesson because I underwent an awakening in 63. I started hitting the books, studying African history. And I realized that, yeah, we had a victory. This was a big fat set of victories. And it was a lot more than I'm discussing here. We did a lot more in this movement. But I realized something. We produce jobs for blacks and people of color, but the way the economy is set up, the way the society is structured so the rich can get rich and the poor can get poor and blacks and brown people and especially red people are on the bottom, that this country is not structured to produce real freedom for our people. And so I began hitting the books in 63 when I underwent an awakening, which if you watch my show, the Dr. Over Tashaka show, there's a link that's being put up on this screen here. Um, we're gonna be doing a webinar in, um, few months called the Sixfold Stages to Mental Freedom. And this is what really relieves you of uh, trauma and stress and all these things. I'm 82 years old, I ain't got no stress. I cause stress. I'm in good health, you understand? Because I underwent this awakening. And one of the things that I underwent in this awakening was a look at African history, which I continue to study. If you see in the background, this library, I've got about 11,000 books. And so one of the first book I read on African history was a book called Lost Cities of Africa by a European scholar, a British scholar called Basil Davidson. And what impressed me most about uh, his study of African history was how African economies were organized. And I discovered that they were organized on a communal basis. And once I understood that, then I could begin to see that there was a model out there that could actually do something for people that capitalism didn't do. Because communalism meant that no one owned the air, the land, or the water. Air, land, and water is shared. Cooperative economics is drawing from that. Ujama is drawing from that. And so what that meant is since uh, the land was not owned by individuals, but was shared by everybody. Everyone had access to land, which means everyone had access to food, which meant there were not great degrees of difference in wealth, even though you had societies where, you know, there were some people more wealthy. In general, you didn't have great poverty. And so uh, that and also there was this uh, other condition with communalism is that you should leave the land, air, and water in better condition than you received it. So there was this environmental ethos, whereas capitalism does in the environment and is now making this planet uninhabitable because a few people control everything, pollute everything to get everything. So this was the beginning of my reorientation that I realized that there was another model out there and it began to enable me to think outside the box, outside the system. And as I studied this model of communalism, I discovered as my book, The Integration Trap, Generation Gap Caused by a Choice Between Two Cultures, you can go to Gumroad over to Shaka, O-B-A-T-S-H-A-K-A, or just go to my site and you can plug into the Gumroad site and pick up the book. And so when I looked at uh, the earliest societies created in the world, hunter-gatherer societies, where men hunted, women gathered. We lived in that state for over 100,000 years. It was the most plentiful society on earth, and it was a sharing society. And so communalism begins with hunter-gatherers. And then what we see is it develops 
as the hunter-gatherers discover agriculture, and those are the women, then they come up with agricultural societies where women were the primary agriculturalists. And some men and women were, but in many and most, the women were. And to this day in Africa, it's the African woman that holds up the economy of Africa. In ancient Egypt or Kemet, it was the African woman who was the farmer. And she was at the base of the economy because it was an agricultural economy. So in looking at communalism, then I could appreciate uh, that there needed to be another kind of economic model. Now, in, and so also as I underwent an awakening, Marcus Garvey became like my first master. And from him, I learned the value of economic self-reliance. In 1965, after uh, we had had our victories in the job movement, I teamed up with a brother named Jim Montgomery, who was a engineer. And uh, we came up with an idea to build cooperative housing for black people. And so I went to the redevelopment agency. That's the agency that has a lot of land and it's usually given to big business. And I just kicked the entire economic power structures behind. So I went to them and told them I wanted a four square block area in the Fillmore on Eddie and Ellis, an area that was worth hundreds of millions then and is worth more than a billion now, billions. And I told them that I wanted to buy that land because I was going to build cooperative housing for the people. And um, Ujama. They said, how much money you have? I said, I got a lot, a dollar. <laughs> and I got this four square block area for a dollar. Then I went to the Senate in 66 and lobbied in the Senate for low and moderate income housing. There was a movement going on around that. And I remember it was 66 because at that time, the person that I had put in office to be uh, national director of core, Floyd McKissick, he was a part of a march against fear uh, that was taken up in Mississippi. And I was saying, this don't make no sense. And then I'm staying at a friend's house in DC. And one of the nights during this march, uh, Kwame Touré, then Stokely Carmack was a good friend of mine, uh, got up and started shouting black power. I said, now that makes sense. <laughs> So I remember it was 66, we got this legislation passed. I went back to the Fillmore Black community. I'm now organizing a group called Pan-African People's Organization. It was then called Afro-American Institute. And so we set up a board of directors and with Jim Montgomery, who was the engineer, we then laid out the plan for the Marcus Garvey, Martin Luther King cooperatives, about 220 units of housing. And we built it. And because my rule is, I don't profit from any movement I led. I've never taken a dime. Um, and I didn't have a place to stay. I stand with my father or a girlfriend, whatever, nine years of organizing, no pay. And I enjoyed it. it's the best period of my life. Um, we turned that over to the people. It was built by HUD. Originally, it was not cooperative housing, but the people went in there and turned it into a cooperative. So that's the first thing. Cooperatives are a good way to go for economic development because everybody has a share in it. And as opposed to one or two people owning everything, everybody has a collective share. In the Marcus Garvey, Martin Luther King cooperatives, each of those units are worth a huge amount of money, at least 800,000, the smallest units, you know? Now, in 1966, I formed a group called Afro-American Institute we later changed the name to Pan-African People's Organization. And this is an organization that is designed to stress institution building. And so we build a school that is still in operation, African Children's Advanced Learning Center. We ran a food program that served thousands of plates of food. My first wife, Anasa Tashaka, was the leader of it. And uh, the sisters cooked the food, the brothers bought it and served it and cleaned the place up and stuff. We had a headquarters that we owned, the building that we own, Malcolm X Unity House. And the meeting place that would hold a couple of hundred people, a uh, large room was called uh, the Marcus Garvey Hall. You know, so Garvey was in my mind. So, and we are now also doing international work. 
So we sent a work team to Africa, to Tanzania in 1973. We sent a work team of 11 people, myself included, and my first wife. I lost uh, 15 pounds working in these villages. And so in 1973, uh, we went to Tanzania, uh, which was based on Ujamaa. They had set up a series of villages called Ujamaa villages under Julius Nereri, who was one of the best leaders of Africa uh, at that time. And so our team, which paid its own way and slept on floors wherever for three months, working in different villages. We worked in different regions of Tanzania, Tabora, T-A-B-O-R-A, Dodoma, D-O-D-O-M-A, and Arusha, A-R-U-S-H-A. The first village we worked in was the most advanced of all of the villages. And in this particular village, which was in the district of Geita in Wanza region, um, we found the most developed of, of the villages. In this village, uh, they had a large area of land that was cooperatively cleared for agriculture. Uh, they had um, a restaurant, they had a hotel for visitors. Uh, they had what they called dukas or stores where they sold things. And some of our sisters uh, worked in the dukas. They had a bank and they had a school and they had a hospital. And the key thing is um, the uh, classrooms, when you went into a classroom, you could have as many as a hundred students and one teacher. And that one teacher, you could drop a dime on the floor and it would sound like a bomb because everybody was intent on learning. The way blacks were when they were in schools where they were nurtured, you know? I was just watching a show on Nas, you know, the great rapper, great rapper, comes from a great family. And how when he was going to school in New York, the schools were so run down that his father had to tell him because he had come out of nurturing black schools in the South. He had to tell him the best thing for him and his brother to do was drop out of school and uh, find you a job or something because this, this school system will destroy you. And I'm not telling students that they should drop out of school now. We need to take over these schools and see that we learn something. But these schools are warehousing and doing kids in and preparing them for jail. But these old Southern schools where you had one room and one teacher was teaching seven or eight different age groups, kids were learning. Why? Because you had nurturing, you had caring, you had teachers who cared about you. And you know, up until um, the late 70s and 80s, Harlem had a lot of good schools. And then suddenly there's a desire on the part of the rich to take everything. And so our kids get no education to prepare them for either prison uh, or the military or death, you know? So um, the uh, system of education in Tanzania was, was one where people were eagerly learning because they saw that they could build up economic development and they could prosper. So what was happening in Tanzania, because uh, we would go to different parts of Tanzania, this is a newspaper that we put out it's called the African Awakener. And underneath that on one side, you see a person with a great big natural, that's me. And then in the middle, uh, there's a brother, his name is Ajili Hodari is a lawyer now, he's a member of Papa at that time. And then on the other side, which would probably be your left side, um, there are three people standing up. Those are political leaders in Tanzania. So it says, Papo establishes base in Tanzania. We had sent this work team and we had established a support system in Tanzania. I would meet with the president of Tanzania in 1977, Julius Nereri, to negotiate some programs. One of our leaders has set up a guest house, a place where people can stay uh, in Zanzibar that operates in Tanzania today. So we, when we looked at the cooperative economics that was going on in Tanzania, we realized that Julius Nereri had a good idea that he was starting coming out of colonialism 
with people who were mainly agricultural. And so what he wanted to do was to use the agricultural economy to build it to a point where they could then take off and get into industrial development. And this advanced uh, Ujamaa village that I talk about was one of the first ones that was ready to do that. And so had Africa taken this route, Africa could be very strong today because in countries like this, the first area you have to develop is agriculture. China's real takeoff in economic development came when a, a real smart man named Deng Xiaoping uh, took over in the 70s and orchestrated the economic development of China. And of course, they had the good luck of America sending its manufacturing to China and then uh, that enabling China to become, along with Europe doing the same thing, the manufacturing warehouse of the world. And so their economy has really taken off. But the key point is when we looked at the cooperative economics that Nareri was carrying out, it was clear that this was the way forward for Africa. He did more things right than any single leader in Africa. His language was Swahili as opposed to the colonial language. Uh, he had tried to enforce some policies that would stress honesty among his leaders, though he had corruption that he had to deal with. Nareri for a long time was riding in a Volkswagen Beetle. He wasn't interested in wealth. When I met with him outside his home, it was just an ordinary home. That was Nareri, you know? He cared about the people. He was in the villages all the time. Now, unfortunately, there are a lot of reasons why this project didn't succeed. And it wasn't because cooperative economics wouldn't work. It was because of the brainwashing, number one, of the people that Nareri had around him. When I met with him, in 77, Nareri said that he could have had other people come in and help them run the country, but he had to have black people. He had to prove that we could run our own country. But what he got with some of these black people were brainwashed Africans who had been, got them a degree at a European university or maybe in Africa, but often in Europe or America. And they had an attitude of superiority towards the people. And so they had no confidence in the people. And as a result, they undermined what the people were building. And then of course, the West was not supportive of this. So I'm not gonna pitch, give you a rose colored picture of what happened in Tanzania. There was sabotage within and the forces outside didn't really wanna see this uh, succeed. But the fact is it was a correct approach. And for black people today in the United States, it's a, a very important arm for economic development cooperatives. Uh, I should note that in uh, the 50s, Chancellor Williams, who's one of our great uh, historians, most people know his book, Destruction of Black Civilization. But this is his greatest book, The Rebirth of African Civilization. Um, he mortgaged his house to do research in Ghana in the 50s with Kwame Nkrumah, who was a great leader in Africa, a great visionary, a believer in African unity, the first uh, south of the Sudan to achieve independence in the late 50s. Um, Kwame Nkrumah allowed Chancellor Williams to go into Ghana and to interview people. So what he did is he did a study and the study was on one question. What kind of system did the people of Ghana want when they became independent? Because at this point, they were in the middle of an independent struggle. They said they didn't want capitalism. They didn't want Marxism or communism. They wanted cooperative democracy. And what they were saying is they wanted communalism. That is an economy of sharing. And so what they were saying is, we want the government, when they come to power, because they knew soon Blacks would be ruling Ghana, to come to us with their ideas. Share them with us. We'll give you our ideas. And then go forward and implement your national program. 
And the key point is they were saying is, and we'll run this local economy because that's how Africa thrived on communalism. The national governments did not decide what the local governments would produce, what they would sell their goods for, that was determined at the local level. And that is not a policy that African leaders at independence have followed. So I wanna conclude by saying that uh, we have cooperatives in the black community. We need to build more of them. We need to pool our money and uh, plan carefully. And you pool your, you have money by saving it instead of putting money into a lot of things we don't need like new cars. I'm 82 years old. I bought one new car in my life. I bought it because I just wanted to have the experience of a new car, but it's a waste of money. As soon as you get off the lot, it loses its value. So instead of talking about what you want, save for what you need and pool that money. And there are a variety of ways for pooling money. And then as you build your business, set aside, as, as we learned in looking at these villages in Tanzania, set aside money for growth and expansion. And you know, there's a lot of things in business development. A lot of our people are good at this. And there's a a, a real spirit of entrepreneurship among Blacks. And we know how anytime we build up business, it gets attacked. And we know what happened in Greenwood. We know what's happened in many cases where Blacks have built wealth. And so one of the things I would say about that is, as Malcolm X often stressed, you need to protect the wealth you build. So I just want to conclude by saying that uh, Ujama uh, comes out of your culture, cooperative economics. And in a society where the business of America is business, we need to take care of some economic business, both on the job front and on the economic development front. So I wanna thank you and I hope you got something out of this. And uh, check out the Dr. Obatashaka show. Um, the link is being provided uh, through uh, the uh, people who are handling this, um, it's at http colon slash slash bit dot ly slash drobashow. No one, you're not going to remember that. Go to the link that is provided for this show. So I want to thank you, and um, I hope you got something out of this. Hotel. You've got to un unmute. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Um, that was so powerful, so many highlights. And I just want to um, summarize some of the high, high, highlights that I remember is, you know, the major points is for one, go to the people and, and see what they want. Once you identify what they want, want, put together a large mass strategy, find the weak points to create that change in the community and uh, to demand those jobs in the, in, uh, for the economy as well. Um, understanding that we need those communal programs, um, just like in the examples that you gave, and we need to pull our money together and our resources together. That was very powerful. I know you didn't have the time to really go into details of those strategies that you use um, in your lifetime. Is there any books or any, maybe one of your YouTube um, channels or anything that uh, can lead us in that direction and learning those strategies to make the change in our communities? Yeah, uh, The Art of Leadership, volume one and two. Now, volume two is largely out of print. So volume one, and if you go to uh, the um, uh, Gumroad, uh, go to my show and you'll see there's a click on for Gumroad and you can order those books directly. I also sign them. And my book, The Integration Trap, Generation Gap, Caused by a Choice Between Two Cultures, that's dealing with current conditions, what's hit our black communities, that's putting our youth in such bad shape and our people in general and how we overcome that. So uh, both of those are good. And I will eventually write a book on strategy. Strategy is about as hard to define as love. You know what I mean? And it's, it's hard because, and so I'm gonna write it, I'm a poet, I'm gonna write it in prose because um, it's, it's, it's such a subtle, beautiful art. When you clean the clock of an enemy, 
<laughs> a big powerful enemy and they just fall and you knew they were going to fall and you just sit there and watch it that is a great pleasure especially when your people are benefiting from it and so when i was young i had the gift but i couldn't explain how to do certain things i just knew how to do it but as i got older I could script it. I could tell you under these circumstances, 85% chance this will work and then sit and watch it happen. Mm. So if you're stressed and everything, it's because when you're oppressed, you got to fight. And when you fight, you got to win. Don't get in battles where you lose. And you will find you put stress on your enemy. You ain't going to have any. You'd be very healthy. And so strategy is, is, is really it. And everything I do is strategy. Mm everything. I don't care what it is. I don't like going somewhere unless it's the shortest way to go. You know what right. I mean? Right. Whatever it is, you know what I mean? And then in martial arts, I like Gung Fu, uh, Charlie Foot, because we got some moves, man. You know what <laughs> I mean? That's all I'll say, some moves. Yeah. And uh, I'm 82, and I, I'm in the gym. I lift 200 pounds. You know, I'm in good shape. But I didn't have to be. I mean, some of these moves we got, oh, <laughs> right. <laughs> that's what I like. You know what I mean? So strategy, don't do stupid. That's the code. That's the starting point. Mm -hmm. Do smart. You know what I mean? Always do smart and do right. Because the real thing about strategy is it's got to be in the employment of a just cause. One, you can win, but it's got to be a just cause. You don't do it for anything that's wrong. You know what I mean? So that's that's key. But those of us who think that just because we're just, we're going to win, uh-uh. There's plenty of proof. I mean, we wouldn't be in this position if that was true. You know what I mean? So <laughs> uh, praise the Lord, pray. We're good prayers. And then pass whatever you need. You know what I mean? Ammunition. It could be whatever. Knowledge, whatever. Pass it. Because God's up there. God gave us a body to do something with. And if we're expecting God to do everything then we're going to be disappointed. God will do God's part, but you got to do your part. Exactly. Exactly. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I look forward to learning from you more. I'm waiting for that strategy book and I'll definitely get, <laughs> get the art of more and just appreciate well, you. Me too. <laughs> It'll take <laughs> me a while because I got a little folder right down here. Every now and then I get inspired. So I write something, but yeah. yeah. And it won't be long either because it's, I, I don't know if you've heard of a guy named Sun Tzu. The art of war. Matter just in China, the art of war. Mm -hmm. And um, I like how they laid their explanations of strategy, prose, mm -hmm. and that's the best way. And so it's not like a step one, step two. No, nah, it's like how water flows. And then how does your strategy compare to water? You know, or how does it compare to the beauty a black woman when she's walking, you know, and guess uh, what? There's a strategy that can come out of that because strategy is beautiful when it's executed properly. If you didn't have dummies in the White House, you wouldn't have this big embarrassment, all this loss of life. And it's mainly the Afghanistans who've lost their lives. But a lot of, uh, you know, U.S. soldiers have, you know, been strained and put into battle for a year on year. And People have been come back, lost limbs, and sometimes just their mental balance for what? You know what I mean? Right. For what? And it was wrong because you stay out of people's country. They say Bin Laden came from there. Well, if he did, if you knew anything about strategy, you would know not to send no army in there. But Bush, want, Bush too, didn't know where the world was. You know what I mean? The boy was not stupid i mean the guy had 120 iq that ain't bad but that's not the point he didn't know anything and so he is being baited bin laden baited the u.s into going into afghanistan that attack on september the 11th uh was an attack designed to get america to do exactly what it did wow and i knew it as a strategist i i have a term for that that's a crown jewel strategy that's a strategy where you go after something valuable. You know what crown jewels are for a man. You go after something valuable, then that person's going to, or this system's going to have to strike out. So you go at the World Trade Center, you go at the Pentagon, and guess what? That third plane was going to the White House. And guess what? It was not taken down by people on board. They shot that plane down mm -hmm. because they knew where it was going. That was the ultimate embarrassment. 
So people who think this was concocted by the power structure in the country, Bin Laden said he did it. Give your people, give your enemy credit. They had some sense. And so if you had a strategist advising the president, that strategist should have told him, yeah, you might do something, but you don't do that. You don't send your army in there, which they didn't the first time. But after that, they did. They got sucked in. 20 year war, which was unjust, hurt more Afghans than anybody else. And, you know, treasure, America lost trillions of dollars, but they lost lives. They lost, they sapped their military. It was dumb. It was not only wrong, it was dumb. You hear me? That's right. And now, you know, they're going to put it all on Biden. Well, Biden's position is I'm getting out <laughs> because. Whenever you get out, the place is going to fall. Now, I think Biden underestimated. He didn't think it would fall that fast. But look at Vietnam. Look at how fast they fell. You know what I mean? So that's the nature of things. You know what I mean? Hmm. All right. Strategy, baby. And basically, our parents tell us this. Do right. And then they expect you to do smart. Mm -hmm. Black people are generally smart. Some of us are losing our... Smarts now, common sense ain't so common now. You see all these people not taking their shots. I know I'm gonna piece some people, people off by saying this, take your shot. Oh, the reason I don't wanna take it is Tuskegee. Well, guess what? The problem with Tuskegee is they didn't give people the shots. Wow. You hear me? The shots that would you know, prevent venereal disease. They were testing them. And guess what? You say this is a conspiracy. Those blacks who were buying into this well, guess what? White people are taking the shots. <laughs> it's the dummies who aren't, the ones who are following Trump. Don't politicize your health. I'm a, uh, I'm a thinker. I have a lot of different things. Philosophy is one. I do not allow a theory to guide practical common sense. Right. You know what I mean? I took my shots. You darn right. And I'm not going to be one of these people gasping on the chair saying, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, take the shot. And Trump <laughs> took the shot and told people not to. Mm -hmm. And now telling them to half-heartedly. You know what I mean? So now a lot of the youth are listening to youth or they're listening to YouTube because it's mainly the youth ain't taking the shots. Not all of them, but some of them. Right. Get some sense. You hear me? Right. Get some sense. Huh. The countries that are doing well with this, they manage this. You know what I mean? And those that could got shots. Much of Africa, parts of Asia aren't getting shots because the West has it. And they got all of these patents and stuff. They want to release it. And we got access to it and not some of us not taking it. Get smart. Yeah. We don't like Trump, but we end up following his philosophy. What kind of crap is that? Right. I'm right. saying strategy. The ultimate strategy is to preserve your life. Do whatever you can to preserve it. And then your family, your friends, you know what I mean? Right. Preserve that. That's most important. Don't do dumb. You hear me? Great strategy. <laughs> so I know because on my show, I got a few people who will respond and give me all the reasons because they heard something on the internet. By the way, there's three nets. The Afro net, the info net, and the ignorant net. And mm. most Blacks too many people are watching the ignorant. Those are people who are sitting on their butts and giving you their opinions all day. What's called assumptions, A-S-S. -S. It would be okay if it was a brain umption or something, you know what I mean? Yeah, right, or a right. thought umption, but an assumption? You know, <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> you don't think of what you're sitting on, you know what I mean? And so people are gonna cite something that they saw on the ignorant net because mm -hmm. they don't have the attention span to read something. This is your life. Right. You know I mean, if you're going to leave, read. This is the key thing. Read. You know? Right. You know, I was watching last night on Netflix, Nas, you know, his history. That's brother's a reader. Mm -hmm. And that brother's father's a jazz musician. And he's piped into the highest realm of the art forum. And he's a thinker. You know what I mean? Deep thinker. I hope I can meet him one of these days. I'm proud of that young man. Right. You know I mean? Nice attitude too. You know what I mean? But he comes in a family where they had some books. They actually hit some books. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? 
<laughs> I said, oh, because I just done a show. I did a show Saturday and I had on, you know, it was on the uh, trauma stuff. Mm -hmm. And I had my replacement, Dr. Siri McDougall on, and he's a fan of Nas. And I could see why, because they come out of the same generation. They're very much alike. You know what I mean? Right. And I'm saying, yeah, you know what I mean? But so if you're going to listen to somebody, listen to somebody who's got some sense. But basically, draw your own conclusion. I put stuff out here. Question everything I say. Go and look at the sources. See, does it make sense? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Huh? Don't buy just because somebody tells you. Minister Farr kind of there telling people uh, that it's a conspiracy. Don't take the shot. Mm -hmm. I like a lot of things about Minister Farrakhan. I spoke at the Million Man March. I was a follow-up person for the Million Man March, you know, met with Farrakhan. I got a lot of respect for him and certain things. He don't know what he's talking about. He don't know what he's talking about. And I don't care who you are, you can be wrong on some stuff, but what's your basis for this? The people who are dying are the people who ain't getting shots. That's the ultimate proof. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying this especially for anyone that isn't because I want you to live. And it ain't just black people. I don't care who you are. Get your head wrapped on right. <laughs> I know I went off on a tangent on that, but um, I a minute ago. too many people dying, man. You know? Yeah. So thank you so much for uh, sharing your heart, uh, sharing the strategies, you know, and um, enjoy your day. And, um, and thank you so much. Goodbye. Okay, and make sure you send me the link. And and by the way, is 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 there going to be this uh, thing up on the screen for my show? The uh, address? Yeah, the address is in the is in the comments section. I uh, posted it a few okay. times. Okay, very good. And uh, send me the link so I can do what I told you I want to do, and I'll let you know when it's up, so you can let your people know to check it out. You know? awesome. But I really appreciate it. Awesome. Have a good night, everyone. Okay.